Along Ship Breaking Yard, India. Along, in the state of Gujarat, India, is a sprawling graveyard where rusted leviathans find their final resting place. Here, at the largest shipbreaking yard on the planet, thousands of vessels have met their end. Along Shipbreaking Yard, a vast complex of 183 individual breaking yards rose from obscurity in 1983, swiftly amassing an estimated net worth exceeding $110 billion. This intricate network of yards undertakes the monumental task of dismantling enormous decommissioned vessels and salvaging and repurposing the materials they once carried. At its height in 2012, Along processed 415 maritime monsters in a year, with much of the work done between tides and by hand. Along's 15,000 manual workers routinely flood onto the sands, surround the beach ships, and salvage what they can. Often, it takes days for ships to be mechanically winched out of the mud and far enough up the beach that they can be worked on due to their immense weight, sometimes causing them to ground half a mile from shore. Yet, the ships that meet their end at Along are not mere shells of steel and iron. Retired freight and cargo vessels arrive carrying a cargo of their own, materials now deemed unsuitable, even hazardous for the shipbuilding industry. Lead, asbestos, acids, mercury, and the deadly carcinogens known as PCBs are daily encounters for workers. This has led to a number of controversies regarding Along's environmental impact and the health, safety, and working conditions of its employees. The beaches on which Along is based are heavily polluted, and the water contains a dangerous quantity of heavy metals. The plight of Along's migrant workers adds another layer to the controversy. Reports indicate they receive half the wages of their counterparts, and there have been allegations of employers erasing employee records of fallen workers to avoid paying compensation. Efforts have been made to improve the workers' conditions, including building the Along Hospital, which is designed to provide emergency care. However, the extent of the pollution has not improved. The International Labor Office still considers shipbreaking to be one of the most deadly professions in the world, partly due to the noxious fumes and cancer-causing gases inhaled by shipbreakers every day. Sidwarho Mudflow, Indonesia In May 2006, P.T. Lapido Brantas, an Indonesian oil and gas company, embarked on an ambitious drilling project, christening the new borehole as the Banjar Panji 1 Exploration Well. Beneath the Earth's crust, an unprecedented disaster lay in wait, ready to unleash a toxic mud volcano of unparalleled scale and consequences. As the company drilled the new well, they penetrated layer after layer of dense clay, sand, shale, volcanic debris, and carbonate rocks. The drilling continued until the well reached over 9,000 feet deep. At this depth, a pocket of water, gas, and steam erupted about 600 feet from the well. Though disconcerting, this initial eruption was not deemed a significant threat. Soon after, however, two more eruptions occurred within 3,000 feet of the well. Local villagers reported encountering hot mud with temperatures around 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Hydrogen sulfide gas filled the air with the acrid stench of rotten eggs. On the fateful day of May 29th, the well unleashed an unimagined fury, creating the monstrosity now known as the Lucy Mud Volcano. It was an unprecedented phenomenon, the most colossal of its kind on our planet. Like a relentless tide, a deluge of mud surged forth, inundating the rice paddies and sugar plantations that lay in its path, destroying homes and decimating livelihoods. The devastation was merciless. A gas pipeline broke open in the eruption, triggering a catastrophic explosion that claimed a dozen lives. The eruption propelled vast quantities of mud up to 700 feet into the air before it came crashing down with incredible force. The volcano continued to emit foul-smelling sulfuric gas, water, and hot steam. The mud flow, dangerously contaminated with heavy metals and toxic chemicals, leaked into the local water supply and surrounding rivers, rendering the water red, salty, and undrinkable. At its peak, the Sidoarho mud flow produced 6.4 million cubic feet of mud daily. Over the next five years, the flow rate decreased by only half. Despite containment efforts, the toxic mud flow displaced 13,000 families. It forced hundreds of businesses, including 30 large factories, to shut down, creating economic turmoil for many Indonesians. 
Although officials blamed a minor, distant earthquake for the disaster, a team of geologists developed a model that attributed the catastrophe to P.T. Lepindobrontus's drilling, which likely fractured pressurized limestone deep beneath the surface. Now, 17 years later, half a billion dollars in compensation has been paid, but the toxic mud continues to flow. Pitcher, Oklahoma Located in Ottawa County, Oklahoma, is the hollow husk of a once-bustling, prosperous, and modern town that has since been abandoned to the ravages of time. This ghost town, named Pitcher, benefited from being a central hub of the Tri-State Mining District for more than a century. Known nationally as an epicenter for zinc and iron mining, Pitcher's prosperity was deeply entwined with the rich minerals beneath its surface. However, the town's glory days came to a halt when the environmental consequences of mining practices began to surface. Decades of excavations beneath the surface of Pitcher rendered many of its structures unsound and resulted in huge heaps of debris being left around the area. This debris, known as chat, is mainly made up of rock fragments, but closer inspection of Pitcher's chat reveals dangerous quantities of toxic metals. A combination of factors contributed to Pitcher's tragic downfall. The dying mining industry, once the town's lifeblood, left an economic void, and the constant threat of cave-ins due to weakened subterranean structures kept the residents in perpetual fear. However, the most alarming factor was the deadly toxins from the chat, which seeped into the earth, poisoning the town's groundwater supply. The surrounding landscape, now marred by treacherous sinkholes, presents a site of desolation. The creek that once gently flowed through Pitcher is now a harsh, acidic red. A disturbing revelation came to light in a 1994 study conducted before the mass exodus. An alarming 34% of Pitcher's children were diagnosed with lead poisoning, a condition with severe, irreversible neurological implications. Unbeknownst to the lurking danger, the children played on the chat mounds and used the toxic debris in their sandboxes. Faced with no other options, the state of Oklahoma decided to buy out the town and mandate evacuation. Pitcher's population plummeted drastically from 1,640 to just 20. Despite being dubbed the most toxic town in America, six households and one resolute business owner refused to be swayed by any price. They continue to inhabit Pitcher today, living without electricity or public services. Yet every year, they are visited by many former residents who return to their ghost town for the nostalgic coming home for Christmas parade. Agbogbloshi, Ghana. Within Ghana's capital city of Accra lies Agbogbloshi, a district infamous for its sprawling electronic waste dumps. An astonishing volume of electronic scrap from the Western world inevitably finds its way here, often under dubious legal circumstances, only to be sifted through by the desperately impoverished citizens of Ghana. Encircled by slums and notorious for rampant crime and deplorable living conditions, Agbogbloshi has acquired a rather grim nickname, Sodom and Gomorrah. Characterized as a digital dumping ground by a Seattle-based charity, it is alleged that several Western nations are complicit in the illicit exportation and disposal of electronic waste. However, many continue to challenge these claims, dismissing them as hoaxes. Regardless of the legal intricacies, the harmful repercussions of the toxic materials present in electronic waste on the local population are undeniable. A significant portion of this waste is incinerated, a process that separates plastics from metals and also disseminates toxic pollutants across the land, air, and water. A cocktail of lethal toxins permeates the area, including arsenic, lead, mercury, dioxins, and furins. One study revealed alarmingly high levels of these toxins, with contamination levels in the earth exceeding acceptable limits by more than a hundred times. The poorest among the populace, often migrants and young families, trawl through mountains of waste in search of salvageable items. For the least fortunate, extracting copper, aluminum, and iron from the debris represents their sole source of income. Yet, despite the myriad of lethal chemicals these workers are exposed to, their wages are criminally low. Children, often seen playing amidst the waste or laboring alongside the adults, face a heightened risk of developmental issues due to toxin exposure. These toxins can severely impact brain development and can also inflict damage on reproductive and nervous systems. The international media spotlight on Agbogbloshi and the wasteful practices of industrialized nations has been intense. Yet, as of now, no party has been held accountable for this environmental and humanitarian crisis. 
Karachi Lake, Russia. Hidden within the rugged contours of the Ural Mountains in central Russia, a deadly, man-made phenomenon unfolds. A once tranquil lake now seethes with the toxicity matching that of the notorious Chernobyl disaster. Lake Karachi is a chilling reminder of the unbridled nuclear ambition of the Soviet Union, with some calling it the most polluted spot on Earth. Three settlements persist a mere four miles away, seemingly in defiance of the looming peril. At the same time, the Kazakhstan border also sits at an uncomfortably close distance. The tale of Lake Karachi's transformation into a toxic cesspool dates back to 1951, when the Mayak facility, one of the Soviet Union's largest nuclear weapon factories, began to use the lake as a convenient dumping ground for nuclear waste. Catastrophic accidents at the facility, however, only served to exacerbate the radioactivity in the surrounding area, turning it into a dangerously irradiated landscape. A remarkable incident in 1957 saw a nuclear waste explosion equivalent to the force of 70 tons of TNT, which contaminated the adjacent land. A decade later, the lake succumbed to drought, resulting in the dispersion of radioactive dust by the wind across the Shelyabinsk region. The Mayak facility, shrouded in secrecy, continued its production of unknown quantities of nuclear materials over the decades. It wasn't until 1990 that the clandestine operations of the factory were revealed. By then, the devastation inflicted on Lake Karachi was so severe that a mere hour's stay on its shores would result in a lethal dose of radiation. The Soviet Union, fully aware of the environmental havoc wreaked by the Mayak factory, suppressed the stark reality until its fall. Scientists finally gained access to the site in 1992, and research into the impact on the local population began in earnest. The fallout from Mayak's reckless operations was grim, with a reported 21% increase of cancer cases, a 25% rise in birth defects, and a 41% spike in leukemia cases in the Shelyabinsk region. Only in 2003, after years of unchecked operations, the Mayak nuclear facility was stripped of its license. However, the damage inflicted is irreparable, rendering the area uninhabitable for an unforeseeable future. Would you visit any of these contaminated places? Comment below, and also let me know what other strange parts of the world you want me to explore. Thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.